Hello, this is Peter, and welcome back to Crushing Comics Haul Around the World, where I take a look at a big old pile of books that I ordered from the United States all the way here to New Zealand. This was 13 books, weighing just shy of 20 pounds. And I've already uh, discarded the giant box that they came in. So now I just have a stack of books. A rather large stack of books. Okay. What's really interesting is, you know, I used to buy the entire Marvel line. I have all of Marvel now in, it's like six to eight short boxes. It's it's everything. Because at the time I was reading it all and I, I realized that the amount of time I was waiting to get those and the money I was spending was something like 2,000%, I think, if I'm doing the math right, of the money I'd be spending on getting Marvel Unlimited and reading all of those issues. Um, I'm looking at my little Superman curl here. Uh, reading all of those issues in the same amount of delay as waiting for the trade paperback. So then I just got Marvel and then I saved a ton of money. And so the things that I'm getting now, it's I'm all in on the Epic line. I'm in to complete my Marvel Masterworks lines that I'm in. I'm generally in on any kind of X-Men collection that fills a gap because I want to complete X-Men uh, shelf. And then I try to support the indie stuff that I dig. And that's really it, which doesn't sound like a really it. It sounds like, dude, that's a lot of books. But um, compared to what I used to get, every, like I used to make orders every single week, so this feels like way scaled back that I can do an order once a month. But there's 20 pounds of books sitting on my lap, so let's get to it. Um, I, this is a good sign of my sickness. I have this Master of Kung Fu epic collection. You all know that I have the complete Master of Kung Fu on my shelf, and this is not including anything different. It's the same exact book to the same exact restoration, but just in a paperback. I come and go about how much I like to read omnibuses. Um, I, I really do not curl up and read them the way that I did when I first started collecting. I way more like the epic collections and paperbacks. And so for me, it's like, maybe one day I won't want those omnibuses anymore, uh, and I want to have the option. Plus, I have all of the epic collections other than the Star Wars ones, so I can't let it go. If only I could let it go. So here's another epic Avengers epic collection. There was just one in the last order. Um, this is Avengers, the Avengers Defenders War, which will also be, or has already been, in a Defenders collection. So that collects Avengers 115 to 128 and Giant Size 1, but also the crossover, which is one of the first extended direct issue-by-issue -issue crossovers in Marvel's history, to Defenders 8 to 11. I am not familiar with this Avengers era at all, except for reviewing it for guides on my page. Um, it's This has definitely been collected and collected and collected. Um, it's probably if they do an Avengers Volume 4 Omnibus, it will be in that as well. So uh, this is not like a big guy. Gap filler, but gap filler for the, ex the epics, at least. Speaking of gap fillers, though, Cable Revolution, woo! So this is huge. It collects Cable 90, 79 to 96. It doesn't look that big, but that's a lot of issues. Um, oh, and it's on this really nice glossy paper. I, I don't know. Can we get like a shine off? There you go. Did you see that? That was some shine. Whereas epic collections are on matte paper. They, it's really hard to get glare off of matte paper. Matte just means like um, toothier, not glossy. This is, I miss when the collections look like this, but you know what? These, the colors in this were made for that era. Like this is the kind of paper that Marvel stuff was printed at the time and different kinds of paper takes color in a different way. Like you could see this in your home printer, like get a piece of glossy photo paper and a piece of really plain, lighter weight like just copy paper and they take colors differently. And so I think it's nice when Marvel prints the thing on the paper that it was originally on. There's a huge gap in Cable. I have all the floppies because I thought I would have to bind them, but Marvel's really come through. We're down to like four issues of Cable that have never been uh, reprinted. And all the rest of this revolution period is actually going into an X-Men, well not all of it, is going into an X-Men revolution omnibus that's going to be out uh, in just a few months. So that is pretty cool stuff. Let's see. Ooh, Lazarus. This is one of my favorite ongoing series, so I can't speak to this specifically. Um, the, basically, Lazarus is one of these books, as are many image books, that is a single writer and a single artist. Uh, the artist is Michael Lark. The writer is Greg Rucka. And it takes a long time, Lark especially, who's an amazing, amazing illustrator, to illustrate the book. So they can't necessarily pump it out 12 issues a year. And I think actually now they're going to like a more like a quarterly schedule or something like that. So this was a chance to get some other creators involved writing stories in this world. Um, different writers, 
different artists. Steve Lieber, great artist, seems to be almost all men. No, no, they did get some some women in there too. Great, and some creators of color. So that's awesome, because uh, it's a very very diverse world, and it's nice to open up the scope of that and get diverse creators creating it too. Awesome. So I can't pitch you exactly what's in these because I haven't read it yet. But Lazarus itself is by far my favorite ongoing series uh, right now. Well, let's not say by far. There's a few other image series I really love. But um, Lazarus is about a world where, not too far off from our own perhaps, where the richest people take over after a major stock market crash and um, basically divvy the world up into parts. And they become the rulers of all the different parts of the world. And each fam there's a certain etiquette for them to follow. And each family has its own kind of master, th their leader, a master negotiator, and then sort of like a warlord type person who's referred to as their Lazarus. And this is the story of the family that controls the Western, what used to be United States, and their Lazarus. And, um, and you know, each one of these territories is managed very differently. The people are having a very different experience. Some of them, everybody's doing well. Some of them, it, you know, there's almost like a slave class. It's fascinating. It's well done. I've reread it multiple times now. I have it in multiple formats. It's that good. Highly, highly recommend it. And I think if you have Comixology Unlimited, which is only like five or six bucks a month, I I do want to say that right now the first trade is available to read for free. Don't take my word. Check on that. Um, let's see. Oh, this is all stuff I'm really excited about. Oh my goodness. Ah, 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 ah. Um, this is Black Monday Murders. It's one of Jonathan Hickman's ongoing comic books right now. It's like um, stock market, Wall Street intrigue combined with like a scary death cult. And um, the first one is, it's dense reading. I remember I was like reading it before bed every night and I was reading half an issue a night. Not because it has so many words in it, but because it just took so much effort to like track what was happening with the characters and make sure I understood everything and fully understood it. They didn't want to just fly through it the way that I would fly through like a big two comic that's just a bunch of punching. And so this is volume two, but I, I probably want to go back and reread volume one before I read this. Um, but I'm really excited. It's a great ongoing series and I'm, I'm really excited to catch up on it. I almost always love Hickman's um, creator own stuff because I'm not a huge East of West fan. I've got it down here, but um, it's I, I still haven't like connected with it. But I, I have ev I literally have everything he's ever done. I love him. Uh, New Lumberjanes. This is Lumberjanes bonus tracks. I'll probably read it even before my kid gets to read it. But she's addicted to lumber. She's literally learned how to read from Lumberjanes and DC Superhero Girls. So these are all their little one shots and things that come in between the regular stories. It's pretty slim, uh, but it's cool because I've never gotten to read those. They have really stepped up the collection of these in the past year or so, I think just because it's good money. Um, this collects Lumberjanes Beyond Bay Leaf special, Lumberjanes Making the Ghost of It special, and Lumberjanes Fair and Square special. So just three specials and some cool pinup art, but this will be well loved in our household. Well loved. This just look cool. It's called Firebug. It's by Johnny Christmas, who's the illustrator of the Angel Catbird series with Margaret Atwood. Didn't love the story, loved the illustration. And also Tamara Bundlin, who's usually a, I want to say, colorist. And she's the colorist here, too. So Johnny Christmas did story and art. Tamara Bundlin did the colors. It looks amazing. And, you know, I, I'm all about just picking something up digital now if I'm interested, but it's a whole trade paperback. It did not come out as singles. They just released it as the specific story. And it's um, it's 80 pages, and it was only after discount less than 10 bucks to get the physical book, and it was similar to get the digital book. So I was like, I would rather have the physical book. So I'm really excited to read this. Very, very excited. Bloodstrike. So... Rob Liefeld's Extreme Studios was one of the launch studios of Image Comics back in the early 90s. Bloodstrike was one of the major ongoing books he started with. It wasn't one of the most long-lasting ones. Um, you know, Young Blood continued, but he had more success with things like Supreme and uh, Glory. I feel like Bloodstrike maybe lasted 22 or 23 issues, and they'd actually done that flash-forward thing and done an issue 25, but then, like, I think, if I'm not wrong, never made it to that. And so, of all of these um, properties, Leafield tends to be pretty cool about like resurrecting them and letting other creators have a crack at them, which I think is neat. Uh, so they've done it with Supreme, they did it with Glory pretty infamously in a Joe Keating uh, series, and then they've also done it here with Bloodstrike. And uh, I think this is actually supposed to continue it. Like, it it's continues the Bloodstrike that we knew, and it's written by Tim Seeley, who's a fantastic writer. Right now, though, I looking at this, I just, in the last week, have read the new Bloodstrike Zero, which is a new series that has a much more indie vibe. Like, this this still looks kind of, like, extreme, right? But this new Bloodstrike Zero 
actually fills in the gaps that were left in that original Extreme series. And it's very, very indie comics, like pen and ink art, um, different vibe, and it's really, really cool. And I, I have all of Bloodstreak um, re you know, ready to bind, and, uh, and I'm really excited to see it continue because I'm a nerd for that 90s image stuff. Uh, Birthright. Volume 6 is by Joshua Williamson. You probably know him from uh, him writing a truly stellar run on Flash right now, but also from his creator-owned Nailbiter. This series is so good. I sat down and I read all five volumes back to back to back uh, just a couple of months ago. They're in a stack right off camera. So good. Totally held up. Was so fun to binge. Uh, deserves oversized treatment because his artist... Uh, what is his on? What is his first name? His artist, Andre Bresson, is phenomenal. And this book is so good. It, it, it's so tense. The story is so huge and wild. Uh, imagine, if you will, a child abducted, a family torn asunder, and then the child returns as He-Man. <laughs> the guy, he comes back, he's, he's stacked, he's got weapons on his back, and he's like, I just want to see my family. Um, I grew up in this fantasy world, and now I'm back a year later. And, uh, of course that is not a normal thing that happens in the world. But you have to ask, why is he back now? Why is he being a little bit shifty about it? And the story that unfolds is amazing. I could not recommend it more highly. One of my favorite books. I debated of what, when I, whether I wanted to get this. It's Wonder Woman Forgotten Legends. This was actually, like, kind of a... Marvel and DC in the 80s, because there was no internet, and there was no collected editions, really... Um, it was hard for them to catch people up on the continuity of characters, and so they would sometimes do these recap series where they would, like, retell the stuff or excerpt the stuff so that, like, people who were picking up comics in the newsstand could get caught up. This was that for Wonder Woman. This was in 1986, and they took excerpts of old Wonder Woman art, and they actually did some new Wonder Woman art, and they basically retold her whole story. The funny thing about that, though, is this is, like, directly prior to her George Perez relaunch post-crisis, so none of this stuff stuck. They were basically reintroducing a character who was about to disappear. Um, and it says, in the aftermath of a universe-shattering crisis, an inanimate clay figure is all that remains of Wonder Woman, champion and defender of Paradise Island, so Queen Hippolyta uses the magic sphere to look back in time and remind the Amazons of the bravery and fortitude of their fallen princess. But this does not track to the following uh, press series. I've got this in paperback, but because it's such a neat, um, encapsulated explanation of Wonder Woman, I thought that it would be fun to um, have it to read with my daughter as well. But it collects The Legend of Wonder Woman 1 through 4, Wonder Woman 318, and Wonder Woman Annual 2. This just keeps going. This book. Ooh, they gave me like a little catalog. Fun. Uh, maybe I'll do some decoupage. Uh, this book is one of my number one recommended comics from 2017. I read it digital and I decided I needed to own a physical copy. It is called Four Kids Walk Into a Bank. It's by Matthew Robinson, who has been, uh, or I'm sorry, Rosenberg. Matthew Rosenberg, who has been amazing at Marvel Comics. He's writing terrific stories. He's so talented, and I think you could teach a class with this book. Not just about a class about comic books, like a class about books, story structure. Uh, it, it feels a lot like Superior, Nick Spencer's Superior Foes of Spider-Man, if you've read that. It has a very David Aja, um, Steve Lieber-looking artwork in the book, although who is the artist? I don't know. Let's take a look. Thomas Marr. As the artist. Uh, fantastic. Just so good. It's oh, It's got a great soft touch cover to it. I'm gonna love that. It's a book about a group of friends. They do eventually walk into a bank, but it's, it's about um, a group of friends. It's very Goonies. It's kind of like what happens when your childhood concepts get a little bit challenged, uh, as well as your ideas of your parents and how are you going to respond. And these kids respond in the best and worst possible way. Uh, and, and things ensue. It's fantastic. Could not recommend more highly. A lot of great books in this batch. A lot of good indie stuff. Um, this is BPRD Volume 2 of Hell on Earth. Interesting thing about this, uh, uh, because I have nothing, of course, no knowledge, as I'm always telling you, because I haven't read my Hellboy collection yet, is that this is missing a page, like literally a page, and Dark Horse actually recalled them and is going to reissue it in August with the missing page, but they already had hit the market and got shipped out. And so, um, In Stock Trades actually has said they're just going to put a new copy in the order of anybody who got out with the original one, which I think is 
amazing, like, it's just one page. It was actually the last page of an issue, so you could almost just do a tip-in. Um, a tip-in is just when you take a print page that you printed yourself and, and put it into the book, and, uh, and it would be fine. So it seems, like, excessive to pulp a huge run of hardcover books, but good on Dark Horse, right? Because DC makes these mistakes all the darn time. Uh, and so, yeah, that's what I know about that book. So I kind of, like, was so confused because I saw that it was being recalled and I saw it was solicited for August. I'm like, I am pretty sure that I bought that book. And lo and behold, I did. Uh, so, I, I mean, I don't need another copy. I, maybe I'll sell that copy, the second copy, and I'll keep the one with the missing page. Who knows? So last, but certainly not least, is an X-Men oversized hardcover. Every It's just like a special Christmas day. Every time more of X-Men gets filled in hardcover, especially this, which was a true oversight to not be filled in previously, and this book itself includes some oversights. So this is X-Men Legion Quest. Uh, gotta get on that Legion TV show marketing. And this collects Uncanny X-Men 318 to 321, which directly preceded the Age of Apocalypse. I don't know, it's down off camera here. And was a crossover uh, and a bit of an event with X-Men, with Cable, and with X-Factor. Now, this basically just collects that little chunk of issues right before Age of Apocalypse, because the thought behind the Age of Apocalypse om omnibus as it is collected is they wanted to start right with entering the Age of Apocalypse without build-up and then end as it leaves. So there was an argument to be made for some of this to be included in that, although it's a hefty book, and, and that's why it wasn't. Here's why I'm like a little eh on this. Um, the X-Men oversized hardcover line has skipped a few issues in that period. So the Fatal Attractions omnibus ends, um, but it, it actually has some later issues, and then the next... Uh, oversized hardcover right now is Phalanx Covenant, which also skips some issues between there and there. And, um, and I really thought that some of those issues would get put in this. I think ultimately there will probably be a Blood Ties oversized hardcover. I think maybe it's already been solicited that will fill in that gap. But, and also they haven't, um, done a whole chunk of issues after Jim Lee leaves and after Executioner's Song of the X-Men 1991 series. So I'm sure Jeff York, who's the um, collections editor for this stuff, has a map somewhere where he's figured it out. But when this first got solicited, I was like, really? That's it? Like, you're not going to catch a couple of those missing issues in here? But now that I see the rest of the plans taking shape, I do kind of understand, although this is a little bit slim, uh, but it's only $75 retail instead of... 100, so we didn't get the X-Men tax in this. And this is a fun story. Uh, and, you know, for people who are reading uh, Legion and watching the TV show, there are really only three Legion stories prior to 2009. There's his original story in New Mutants, which Marvel reissued. There's his his participation in the Muir Island saga, which Marvel reissued as a trade paperback. And then there's this. And then there's really not Legion. Uh, I'm actually working on a guide for him right now, and the guide is, like, real damn short uh, until he comes back in New Mutants 2009, which is a fantastic series. So, happy to have this, always happy to fill in a gap. It's something I've asked for, and, you know, not looking that gift horse in the mouth. So that's it for that huge order of books from the state. So, tell me, did you pick up any of these books? Do you want to now pick up any of these books, especially since I was pitching you hard on a couple of them? Uh, and if you have been reading some of those books, do you agree with my assessment of some of my favorites, including Lazarus, Black Monday, Murders, and Birthright? I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Haul Around the World from Crushing Comics.